Hi everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Amplify Horse Racing Hangouts. I am your host, Anise Montpleasure of Amplify Horse Racing and the Kentucky Equine Education Project Foundation. And if you are new to this, or you know, if you just need a reminder for whatever reason, Amplify Horse Racing is a 501c3 nonprofit promoting careers and education in the thoroughbred industry. So if you've stumbled upon this, this is our Amplify Horse Racing Hangouts, our monthly virtual education event where we invite you into the conversation with an industry professional to talk about a specific career or topic. Uh, this season's theme is how to. So we're talking about careers that are in demand in the industry that are basically always hiring and, you know, sharing some of the skills that you would need to have in order to get started in that career, or at least get set off in the right direction. So I want to remind you that from wherever you are watching this from right now, whether you're watching on Facebook or Twitter or YouTube, you can actually send us your questions live right now, wherever you are watching, you can comment on this feed and send us your questions. And we will actually be able to bring those up on the screen and answer them live, which is really, really exciting. So before we get too far into this, uh, we have something a little bit new for tonight. You guys know that I love to do some announcements and we are actually excited to welcome a sponsor. So Amplify Horse Racing is excited to welcome the University of Louisville Equine Industry Program as a premier educational partner and sponsor of the Amplify Horse Racing Hangouts. The Equine Industry Program at the University of Louisville is one of only a few undergraduate equine programs in the world housed in an AACSB accredited college of business. Here you'll learn the skills to develop your love of horses into a viable career. The goal of the equine industry program is to produce graduates with sound business knowledge. Programs offered include a BSBA in equine business, minor in equine business, certificate in equine business, and a graduate certificate in horse racing industry business. So if you didn't already figure it out by looking at the screen, you can scan that big old QR code right there and head on over to their website and check that out. So we're very thankful for their sponsorship, excited to have them on board. And I'm really excited about uh, another thing that is coming up. The big development for Amplify is that we have launched Amplify Junior, sponsored by My Racehorse, which is a equine career, not careers, just an equine educational tour series. I'm so used to talking about careers that now we're talking about some of our children's programming. We hope that they will go on to a career in the equine industry someday, but we've launched Amplify Junior, a tour series for children 12 and under. And our first event is happening this Saturday at Godolphin's Gainesboro Farm near Versailles, Kentucky. So if you happen to be a parent and you're watching this, you can head on over to our website, amplifyhorseracing.org slash Amplify Junior and get your kiddos signed up today because that's going to be really fun. And that will be a series that we will continue through October of this year. So whew, done with the announcements and on to the topic for tonight, which I think is one that I at least hope is going to be really popular. And I think uh, is one that I would have been very intrigued by when I was first getting involved in the industry. And that is that we're going to talk about exercise riders. How do you become an exercise rider? What is an exercise rider? So an exercise rider is not the same as a jockey. Uh, an exercise rider does basically what the name says. They are exercising racehorses during morning training. So they are preparing them for their eventual races. Uh, they, you know, might be riding young horses, like help with some of the, you know, early training as, you know, the two-year-olds are getting used to the track and, and preparing for their first race. Uh, that can be a way that many people actually start learning to exercise ride is by getting on some of those younger horses that have, you know, less experience, are less likely to really pull your arms off, maybe don't know exactly what they're doing yet. 
uh, and then eventually work your way up to, you know, much stronger, more advanced horses. And so we are going to be joined by a very special guest who's going to talk about a program that she oversees, um, which is very, very unique to give students the opportunity to learn how to exercise ride in a controlled setting. Many people who I know who have been exercise riders or currently are exercise riders in the industry might have learned by like I said, getting on two-year-olds, maybe they started at a training facility, you know, a controlled environment, and then went on to work at the track. Uh, I rode for a while. Uh, I started at a very, very small track. There was an arena at the track that somebody uh, put me on some horses in, and then eventually worked my way up to going on to the track, and then eventually moved on to a bigger track to ride at. And it was a, an amazing learning experience and uh, something that I, I would maybe love to get back to, but definitely have to build my strength up for again. So really excited to talk about this subject and get on to welcoming our guest for today. So, and that special guest is Miss Dixie Kendall. She is the program coordinator for BCTC Equine, home of the North American Racing Academy. BCTC Equine offers the first and only community college-based racehorse riding certificate in the United States. Prior to joining BCTC in 2011, Kendall held numerous leadership positions in the thoroughbred industry, including being a farm manager for a thoroughbred nursery and sales consignment, as well as a licensed thoroughbred trainer. Kendall also spent several years in the saddle as an exercise rider prior to her management roles in the industry. So I'm really excited for her to share her experiences about that. In addition to her role as the lead instructor at BCTC Equine, Kendall also competes in endurance racing with an off-the-track thoroughbred to promote the thoroughbred breed in the sport. So without further ado, welcome Dixie and thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Anise. Thanks for having me. So I always start by asking our speakers to talk about their own personal story and, and what inspired you to get into the sport. Because I find that a lot of speakers had a passion for horses, but they maybe kind of stumbled upon racing by some happenstance way. So what, what connected you with the thoroughbred industry? So I, I actually got my start with horses in general. My dad was an avid handicapper. So I spent a lot of my childhood in the simulcast rooms in an off-track betting facility. And watching horse racing on TV is what first drew me to horses. So, so I guess I was fortunate that my first exposure was horse racing. Um, and that was what kind of drew me in for my love of horses. And so how did you, you know, the, the setting that you got involved in doesn't necessarily, you know, mean that it was easy to make a connection with someone and actually work in the industry. So how did you take that next step to pursuing a job and, and eventually working in it? Um, so I, I, I kind of have a, a unique story in the sense that I, I snuck off to the track when I was 16 and um, I, Ellis Park was the closest racetrack to where I lived at the time and um, just kind of went barn to barn trying to find a trainer who would be willing to hire me on and was very fortunate to find someone that would give me a chance and started me out walking hots and then eventually got up to my way to, to being an exercise rider. But um, you know, it, it definitely was not the easiest pathway to get into the industry and, and lots of opportunities there that I had, but missed opportunities, not having those connections early on. So something I really value that we can provide our students with BCTC Equine. Now that, that's something that uh, I'm excited to talk about the program because, you know, as I tried to highlight in the intro, I feel like a lot of times it's, it doesn't, uh, it's not a very linear path when it comes to becoming an exercise rider. And a lot of times people are not learning in a controlled structured environment, which can sometimes not be the safest. And what you guys provide is a very, you know, a specific program and a curriculum and you offer a lot of experience to be able to guide your students through the process. So we're going to, we're going to get into more of that, but, what what was it about the equine industry that made you want to work in it? 
I, I was just obsessed. I, I loved horses from a young age, seeing them on the TV for simulcast. And my dad took me to a couple of live races. It, it just, it was an obsession from early on. You know, I was always an animal person and um, I'm a competitive individual. I just, something about it just drew me in and, and it never let me go. So. In throughout those early experiences, as you were getting involved in the sport, were there any things that you learned from mentors or maybe even hard lessons learned that you've carried with you and maybe try to pass on to your students and, and teach them? Yeah. I mean, you know, to try to pick one particular moment or one particular thing, I, I think one of the things that I've found I love so much about the equine industry and horse racing also is that it's a continuously learning opportunity. You know, you, you never really know everything or know exactly what the right path is. It's never a black and white answer. So I think for me, it was just the opportunities to be able to continuously learn and find that there's never going to be a point that I feel stagnant in my career. I'm always I'm always learning something new, whether it's how to train a horse, uh, you know, a particular method or, you know, this format or the other. Um, I think that for me was really really what I've enjoyed the most is the continuous learning format. So I know I, I mentioned a little bit about the program in the intro, and um, you've told me a lot about the BCTC equine program before. We're going to have a video coming out about you on our social media in a couple weeks. But for audience members who might not be familiar with it, can you share all the different offerings at, at BCTC Equine for those who want to pursue that exercise rider path? Because they have to take additional, they can't just take the racehorse riding class, correct? They have to take more classes than just that. Right. So uh, the program as a whole, BCTC Equine, a lot of people in the industry know us as the North American Racing Academy. And we recently rebranded in the last couple of years to BCTC Equine because we wanted to showcase all the offerings of the program. Um, originally started in 2006 by Hall of Fame jockey Chris McCarron, we really got kind of identified as a jockey school and we offer a great racehorse riding program that obviously we're very proud of. We wanted to be able to showcase all the other things the program offers. So our exercise rider certificate is what uh, helps prepare someone for a career as an exercise rider or as a jockey. And part of that is that they have to take our foundational lab courses, which teaches all the basic uh, horsemanship skills, everything you need to care and, and prepare a horse for training on the racetrack, as well as our intro to racing industry class. And that focuses on identifying track poles, being able to read a condition book and a past performance. We talk a lot about the different career opportunities in the industry as well. So they have to successfully complete those courses as well as do a physical fitness tryout and basic riding tryout to get into our racehorse riding classes. But also in addition to that certificate, we offer a one semester equine industry workforce certificate an equine veterinary assistant certificate and then our full two year associate in applied science and equine studies degree. So when someone expresses interest in wanting to take the, the racehorse riding class, how do you start preparing them for that? Or what kind of pre, do they, do they have to have a foundation in being able to ride? Are there any prerequisite uh, horse handling experiences that they have to have under their belt? Not necessarily. So we do have those prerequisite courses that we offer, and those are going to be their primary horse handling, horse care lab classes that we conduct out at the Thoroughbred Training Center. Um, so those are prerequisite classes they have to complete as part of our program. But as far as their experience prior to coming to the program, they're not required to have any riding or any, any specific requirements, particularly. Um, you know, in fact, I've had several students that have come to the program with no riding experience. They really took a passion towards working towards their physical fitness and their balance and their abilities. Um, and they, they successfully got into the course, successfully completed the course, and, and they're actually looking to become licensed as jockeys. Um, they are licensed as exercise riders, but a couple of them are actually coming on to become jockeys here in the next few months. That's really cool. And I know that you, you know, at the end of this episode, we're going to talk about kind of your four main takeaway points that you've sent me. 
and athletic ability is one of those. And you mentioned that about them taking a, a fitness test before they can do the course. So what is some of the fitness that you recommend or the, you know, the level of fitness that you require for students who want to eventually ride race horses? Um, you know, so our physical fitness test is very basic. It, it consists of things like a press up, um, sit ups, a two point position on an equisizer, um, and then a mile run. And, and those are very basic components that we ask of our students. The other part of our tryout process is, is a very basic riding that they simply walk trot around our shed row. We put them on a lunge line to test their balance. Um, I, I use uh, as one of my resources for my prospective students, one of my graduates is a personal trainer. So she's been an excellent resource for my students to be able to talk with and work with to develop their fitness skills. And she actually, as an exercise rider herself in previous years, is able to use a lot of her experience to help develop specific fitness regimens for those students to help them prepare for the tryouts. It was funny last, last, no, two weekends ago, I was out at Keeneland for Kids Club Family Day and we had um, actually one of the BCTC equine uh, equisizers out there. And then we have Amplify has an equipony. So it's like a pony size equisizer that the little, little kiddos can get on. And one of the jockeys came over and got on the equisizer and, and uh, was giving a riding demonstration to the kids. And it's so funny. He was showing them the, you know, the proper riding form and having them crouch down, you know, kind of stand out of the stirrups a little bit. And it was so funny how these little kids are huffing and puffing and panting. They're like, this is so hard. And they're trying to race against each other. So it really does take a lot of, I mean, that's just a static thing. That's not even a, a moving horse underneath you. And it takes a lot of fitness to be good at it and sustain that and definitely different fitness um requirements for being an exercise rider versus a jockey you know you have very different requirements in terms of what you're doing um, with your day in day out job so i really compare for our students i tell them to think of the exercise riding if their end goal is to become a jockey you know you had to learn how to walk before you ran so they have to learn how to gallop before they can race ride. And it's not that there won't be a transition in what the physical requirements are as they progress towards those careers, but you, you have to be able to understand the dynamics of galloping a horse before you would be qualified to race ride. So I, I have two questions as part of that. Can you talk about, for maybe someone who's watching this, explain that physical progression of what your fitness level has to be to be a jockey versus uh, an exercise rider and what maybe your daily riding requirements would be as a starting exercise rider? So, you know, as an exercise rider, once you reach a level that, um, you know, you're a professional asset to a stable and, and you're someone that's going to get on hopefully 10, maybe 15 horses a day, whether you're riding horses just in the morning at the track or getting on young horses in the afternoon that are starting their breaking process, um, your fitness really depends on what type of horse you're getting on and, and how many horses. So for those riders in the mornings that are going to gallop a lot of the strong, older horses, it's a different physical requirement than getting on the young horses that are just learning and, and need a little bit more push to go forward as opposed to the pull to come back in the mornings. But, you know, for jockeys, and, and I can't speak to the physical levels that are required of jockeys. I, I was never going to be fortunate enough to make weight to be a jockey. And uh, one good equisizer race against Chris McCarron, and I knew I stood no chance of being a, a champion jockey at any point. Um, it's just a very different dynamic. And I, I was watching a video earlier as I was thinking about this presentation tonight. And I thought it was an interesting thing that this guy said, he goes, the best, um, you know, the best jockeys are the worst exercise riders. And it's kind of true in the sense that you have very different strengths for each different type of rider. As an exercise rider, you're built a little bit stronger, a little bit stouter, meant to be able to kind of keep a horse in holds. You're not really doing that speed work component of it. And your jockeys are much more developed to be able to get that streamlined aerodynamic form and be able to really push a horse for full speed. So definitely different dynamics depending on the type of horse you're riding and then what you're asking the horse for with your exercise. 
It was funny you said that about the older horses because when I I started, I definitely was only on these two year olds that had never raced before and were just, you know, soft mouths and just kind of going along, like happy to be out and about. And then I had a the the trainer I was riding for thought that I was ready to get on this six year old gelding. And the strength level was massively different between, you know, the two-year-old fillies that I was on versus this gelding. And I got run off with uh, real good. And he, uh, he was very smart. And he eventually just knew that I had had enough and slowed himself down and stopped. But it's, it's amazing how as the horses get older and as they get stronger and progress in their own racing careers, how you also have to strengthen as a rider along with them too. And so I know that you guys have, um, you know, a lot of teaching horses at the schools. And so what are their backgrounds? So we keep 12 off the track thoroughbreds as part of our program and, and they they are absolutely the heart of our program. They really make everything function. Um, they all come from different backgrounds. Some of them were racing rejects that they never made it to their first race. Some of them have a few races under their belt, but all off the track racehorses. Some of them never made it off the farm. They were started under saddle and from the early get go, people realized they were too slow to make it. Um, and I tell people when we're looking for prospective school horses, we love horses that had breathing problems because they run off with my students. They get tired pretty quick and they pull up pretty easy. So those are those are my best school horses. But, you know, what's really neat is that among those 12 horses, I have 12 different personalities and the, the privilege I have to be able to work with those horses year in and year out. I get to know them very well. So it's pretty easy for me to spot when one of them's about to kind of drop a shoulder and dump a student or take off with them. And, and it helps me to coach the students along because I know what that horse's in and outs are. So um, they, they really do make the program successful in the sense that we can provide as much structure and as much consistency as possible. Um, because what trick worked the year before with that horse typically works again the next year. So it gives us the ability to instruct the students as to how to, how to work through different problems and scenarios they'll encounter. When you get your students started riding, uh, how do you start them with that process and how do you work them up in levels, I guess? How do you level up with your riders? Yeah, so it's a quick process. Uh, we are conducting both of our racehorse riding courses this year over our summer semester, which in itself is just 12 weeks long. Um, so there's two level classes within that, two, a six week course, yeah, first and second six weeks of summer. Um, but basically the progression is, is that the students get kind of a 30 minute crash course on the equisizer of what to expect once they're legged up on the horse, how to tie their knot, how to adjust their irons, all the very basics of riding a racehorse. And then from there, we start out in our shed row at our barn at the Thoroughbred Training Center. Um, obviously, we start out walking, progressing up to a trot. And they have to pass a certain type of uh, assessment in the shed row to be granted permission to go out to the public gallop field that's out at the training center. At that point, what we're looking at is they'll start progressing to the point where they'll be allowed to gallop out there. And they have another ass assessment list that they have to check off that they can demonstrate competency to gallop out in the public field. What we're really lucky with our program and being housed at the training center, which is owned by Keeneland, um, they allow us to use the track for half an hour after it closes. So we'll have the racetrack entirely to ourselves for half an hour for the students to progress down to that point, learn kind of the rules of the road, what, what's expected on the track, how the horses change when they go from the field to the racetrack. And they'll have to progress from that point to be able to gallop after hours up to normal training hours. And that's kind of a dual process that not only am I looking at the students, but the outriders there are looking at the students. They're the ones that make the decision to say, yes, this person can come onto the track during normal hours. Yes, they're ready to start riding horses um, you know, during earlier hours when we're seeing more speed work on the track. And then at that point, once the students kind of checked off all those boxes, then they'll be able to ride for a trainer that we have a contract with and that the outriders have approved for them to start riding horses for him, that'll work towards them getting their license as an exercise rider. I love that there's that steady, natural progression through the program 
but I can imagine that was probably a lot different when you were learning how to ride. What was that environment like? How did you get started? Um, yeah, my, my first experience, I mean, I was lucky enough, I guess I got thrown on a horse in the shed row and, you know, jogged a few sets, but prior to, prior to going to the racetrack, when I was younger, um, the only horses I had ever been on were gated horses. So for me, it was really interesting to get on a thoroughbred that's not gated, um, and trotting along and I'm bouncing all over the place. And the trainer's like, what are you doing? I thought you said you had ridden before. And I was like, I don't know what's happening. Why is he so bouncy? Um, so it, it was not a, it was not an easy learning process. Um, but I was lucky that the trainer that I got on with put me on young horses that weren't extremely strong, um, and, and progressed in that sense, but it, it definitely was not the controlled environment. And I think for me as a rider and, and something I've learned about myself through self-reflection is that, you know, I, I had a lot of anxiety with the activity and the busyness of a track in normal morning hours. So I really appreciate the opportunity we have with the program that their first exposure, our students' first exposure to the track is after hours. Um, because, you know, when you make those kind of mistakes and, and to be out there and you're under the pressure of everyone watching, it's really daunting for someone. So the ability to be able to take that component out of it really helps them to relax and um, usually my, my words of wisdom to our students, the first time they go to the track, they're all super excited. And I tell them, guys, it's just circles on dirt. Don't get worked up over it. Um, and that usually kind of calms them down a bit and, and brings them back down to earth of what they need to do. So. So for someone who might not be familiar with the normal traffic on a, a racetrack in the morning, say Churchill Downs during training hours or Keeneland during training hours, can you explain who is going in what directions and why it's really important to have an understanding of that before you go out to a track uh, with a bunch of other riders during training hours? Yeah, um, you know, what I call the rules of the road are just so important as a rider because, you know, to someone who's not knowledgeable of what they're looking at, it, it really is organized chaos out there on the racetrack in the morning. You could have anywhere from 50 plus horses at the track at one particular time that are training. And if someone doesn't know the rules of the road, what direction they're meant to be going at what pace, it can get really dangerous. Um, so, you know, the next time that somebody's out looking at the track, if you're not knowledgeable of what you're looking at in the mornings, your horse is on the outside rail towards the outer rail that we stand on when we're watching track as a spectator or watching races as a spectator. Um, you'll notice that horses are walking or trotting what we call going the wrong way. They're going towards the right or clock or counterclockwise um, or clockwise. Um, so that's meant to be only at a walk or a trot. And then as horses turn in and they face the direction, they go the direction we see them racing in the afternoons, the faster that horse is traveling, the closer to the inside rail they're meant to be. So that puts all your speed workers to the left and towards the inside rail. And progressively as a horse is going slower, they should be further away from that rail. And kind of the idea behind that is that your fast working horses are as far away from your horses tracking the wrong way so that we avoid as many head on collisions as possible. Um, you know, you never should be cantering or going faster than a trot going the wrong way on the outside rail. And, and when you think about how many horses and the speeds that they're traveling during the morning workouts, it's really important everybody's following those rules of the road for safety. It definitely, your first time going out to the track, uh, when you don't know that just as a spectator, it really can look like organized chaos. And if you have riders that are not respectful of the rules of the road, it, it can be very, very dangerous for others. I think it would be great if you would touch on safety because you know it can be a very dangerous job and there are things that you can do to maybe minimize or lessen the danger by being a smart rider but how do you uh, talk to your students or caution them on the safety piece? Uh, we really stress to them, um, you know, rules of the road that they understand what, what they're meant to be doing at what particular parts of the track. We talk about what protocols to put in place as far as if there's a loose horse on the track, how they're meant to react on their own horses how to communicate with the outriders in the instant that they may be getting run off with, or if they're running into any type of problems. 
Um, so a lot of it is communication. It's trying to plan ahead for any particular instance they might run into. But as would happen with any rider and, and young green riders particularly, um, it's easy to talk about and it's easy to, to prepare for, but then in the heat of the moment sometimes can be a bit daunting. So, you know, that's another instance where it is nice that we have that track after hours that to some extent we can kind of simulate those experiences and we are hopeful that the students get that opportunity to kind of go through that process. But we really stress to them rules of the road, knowing where they're meant to be at. Um, I video our students and then we talk through their replays to talk about where they were at the track in relation to what speed they were going. We assess them as far as did they follow protocol? Were they only trotting going the wrong way? Were they at the right spot on the track for the speed they were going? Um, if there was a loose horse, did they enact the proper protocols to make sure that they were, were safe about it? And then the outriders are also a big part of our program that they give feedback to the students to help them because they have so much experience seeing so many riders over the years. Mm -hmm. So their, their expertise is really critical too, as far as our students' progression. I found it really interesting when you mentioned that piece about teaching them how to communicate with the outriders. For someone who might not know, first, can you talk about what an outrider is? And then how do you, how do you encourage your students to communicate with them? Because it's not like you can be leaning off your horse, waving, being like, I'm getting run off with has to be much more subtle than that. I don't know. When you're getting run off with every once in a while, it is just to throw an arm in the air and, and, and pray for help. So, um, well, you know, an outrider, I, what we refer to them as far as the analogy is that they're the police of the racetrack. They're the ones who, that are meant to supervise all the track activity in the mornings, make sure everyone's following the rules of the road. Um, keep everyone safe. That's their responsibility. And they they are such a critical part of the racetrack um, that they ensure everyone's safety. So for us, we're really, when we have access to that track after hours, we have an outrider and an EMT on site with us at all times. So not only am I there watching the students during the, that time, that outrider's there as well. Um, so teaching the students how to communicate with an outrider and what's really important when you're getting run off with or if you're running into a problem is that you give the outrider enough time to prepare because a loose horse or a horse going at full speed that's out of control, um, the outrider can only do so much if they're not able to get ahead of that horse that they can then catch that horse to help you. So we talk a little bit about, hey, if you're getting run off with, if you feel like you're about to get run off with, here's how you should communicate with the rider. Um, and, and the hard part with all of that is sometimes it's a scenario by scenario basis. It may be different for if you're getting run off with in this instance versus if we're, you know, at a different part of the track. So um, it's great that we have the opportunity to have the outrider there and we can go through different scenarios with the students um, on the track like that. But but yeah, I mean, look, there's been plenty of times in my career that I just threw an arm up and said, I need help. <laughs> Um, That's something I wish somebody would have taught me because I did not learn in that kind of controlled environment. And, you know, I definitely did get run off with a couple times and was probably very lucky that I did not get hurt. And, you know, I wish that somebody would have gone through that kind of instruction. Like, this is how you flag down the outrider if you need help and your horse needs to be pulled up and your arms are shaken and your legs are shaken. So yeah. it's great that you guys all have that kind of communication. Yeah, another big part of it too, and what I really encourage my students to think about is that relationship with those outriders is really important and, and something that maybe when you're just jogging the horse, you're ready to gallop and you know it's a tough horse, you know it's gonna be a tough ride. You just let that outrider know like, hey, this horse, I know he's gonna be tough. If you don't mind to kind of keep an eye on me, I may need a little bit of help pulling him up or, um, it's all about communication and, and giving the outrider a chance to know and prepare so that they can assist you. I think this is a good time to just pause briefly and remind everyone watching right now, if you're watching this live, you can comment and send in your questions or comments for Dixie. If there's anything that you want to know about being an exercise rider, becoming an exercise rider, or even training or racing in general she is a wealth of knowledge and we can bring up those questions live and answer them so wherever you're watching from send in your questions 
and we will get to those. And the the time is a ticking. I don't have my watch on, but once we get to the end of the show, y'all, if you haven't sent your questions yet, then you have to send me an email. So Dixie, I want to talk to you about your off the track thoroughbred because you you personally do a different kind of racing. You're into endurance racing. So had had you what inspired you, I guess, to take on an off the track horse, first of all? Thoroughbreds have been my whole career. Um, you know, I like I said, I got my start with horses in the off track betting, watching simulcast, seeing race horses on TV. And um, from there it was it was sneaking off to the track when I was 16. I told my parents I was going to summer camp and I actually went to the racetrack to try to learn how to gallop racehorses. And um, I mean, they've just been my whole career. So for me, I always loved uh, trail riding when I was younger. That was kind of the only outlet I had to horses aside from going and watching the simulcast. And so when I found out about endurance racing, I was like, that's a pretty cool opportunity for me to combine two things that I love. I knew I was never going to make weight to be a jockey. So a professional career as a jockey was out. Um, and, and so when I had the opportunity to get back into endurance racing, life had slowed down a little bit that I had the, the time and the resources to do so. I, I knew that I wanted to get a thoroughbred because I wanted to showcase the breed in a sport that they're not very well known for. Um, that, that was really my primary objective with getting a thoroughbred. And I, I'm extremely pleased with my horse and how well she's done. So that's so cool. How did you, when you were searching for, for your off the track thoroughbred, were you looking specifically for a horse that would be very, or could have the potential to be talented at endurance or did, was it more of a, you guys clicked personality wise and she just felt like the right fit. How did you go about that search? Um, I definitely was looking for an endurance prospect when I, I was looking for my horse. Um, it, she actually, you know, I'm in my mid thirties at this point and she was my first horse I ever bought for personal purpose. You know, I'd never owned a horse for personal purpose prior to her. So I really took my time looking. Um, I wanted a horse that had a little trail experience that at least been out on the trail and had not had a major panic attack uh, being out in the woods. And other than that, the criteria was just to have good feet that she didn't have, you know, a, a long list of injuries or anything prior. Um, and, and I was, I was happy to take on something green, something young. Um, but I, I went and tried her and honestly, about 10 minutes into the ride, I knew she was the horse I wanted and I was ready to bring her home. So That's we, so we cool. clicked from the beginning. That's awesome. It's, it's so fun when you're searching for a new horse too. And it's like trying to find that the mix of what you want personality wise that clicks with you, but then also what you're pointing them towards competition wise. Um, but yeah, my, my gelding, if he had any sort of uh, physical ability uh, besides plodding along endurance would probably be pretty good for him because he's so chill, but he doesn't go much faster than a walk. Yeah. You know, it's funny. We talk about as far as exercise riding and, and the different types of horses you get on. Um, you know, my preference when I was galloping, I, I liked getting on the young horses because I really enjoyed teaching the young horses the different you know things that they needed to know to be a racehorse. But I really loved the big, strong, burly colts. Um, I was a little bit taller, a little bit you know heavier than some of the other riders, the other female riders, at least. So it was it was really fun for me to get on those big, strong colts that you just had to kind of muscle around the track. And the horses I struggled with the most were the fractious fillies, you know, the ones that got really nervous or um, they could be really darty underneath you and, and extremely opinionated, as we know mares can be. And uh, I ended up with a darty, flighty, uh, opinionated mare for my endurance horse. Um, but she's been one of the best things in the world for me to be a better rider and to learn more about my abilities and, and teach me to be a more patient rider. So I think that's a really cool thing to touch on is how adaptable of a rider you have to become when you're exercise riding horses, because you have to be able to get on that horse and get a feel for whether they are flighty, whether they are feeling really strong and really good that day. I think maybe a tip that I would give people who are, you know, maybe you're in college right now and you're interested in doing this or, um, you know, if you have 
or even in, in high school, and if you have the ability to ride in school and do something like the um, Interscholastic Equestrian Association or in college, IHSA, the Intercollegiate Horse Show Association, I found that that was a really beneficial experience when you're on a team and you have to you know, show up at a different school, you draw your horse randomly, you have to get on that horse for the first time when you're in the ring. It's not the same as getting on a thoroughbred because these are very, you know, controlled school horses, but just being able to learn that adaptability and, you know, what would you recommend just riding wise for someone who maybe already rides and wants to build up their ability toward maybe targeting becoming an exercise rider and becoming more adaptable to different horses? Um, I, I definitely recommend get on as many horses as you can because your ability to be, like you said, adaptable. Um, and we tend to develop habits when we get on the same horse repetitively. Uh, so the opportunity to be able to get on as many different horses as you can in lessons, anything that, that encourages balance, that encourages contact. Obviously, the way that we ride race horses is very different than other disciplines. The way we hold our reins and the way that we interact with the horses, um, how we ask them to balance and those type of things. But anything that encourages someone's comfort level in the saddle, that encourages their ability to kind of read a horse underneath them and react in a positive manner, that's all going to be positive translating over to riding race horses. We got a question, which I'm really excited about. Rachel Wagley. Hi, Rachel. Rachel is a good friend of, of Amplify. What's the best riding advice you've gotten, Dixie? Um, so, well, I, I'll give two pieces of advice because I this is something that's always ingrained in my mind, and this was more so for jockeys than it was exercise riders. But Chris McCarran said to his class, um, you know, I was really lucky to work alongside him my first few years with the program. And he told his class of, of prospective jockeys, he said, the best jockey is the one who causes the least amount of hindrance to the horse. And that was something that really stuck with me because as riders, we're trying to encourage our horses for their best performance. And often as riders, we create a lot of hindrance in their movement and in their performance. If we're not balanced, if we're not encouraging that horse to utilize their movement properly. So that was definitely a piece of advice that, that stuck with me. And I think it's applicable for exercise riders or jockeys, but I think he meant that more towards his jocks at the moment. But, um, you know, probably the best piece of advice I've been given in general for riding is control your emotions to make sure that when you're in the saddle, you're not emotional, that you are trying to create a positive learning environment for that horse and that you are, are trying to do your best to always create a positive scenario. Um, Cause the horses really feed off the emotion. They really tend to, feed off it negatively if it's not something that's constructive and positive. Um, so being able to control your emotions in the saddle, I think is a really important part of, of being a good rider and not one of my strengths I'll add. So uh, definitely one of my weaknesses I work on continuously to try to be a better rider. It's kind of like one of those life lessons that riding teaches you, right? Like that's kind of life, you know, learning to control your emotions and channel them positively, but always, generating something positive for that situation that you're in regardless of what's being thrown at you yeah so, there's a lot of life lessons learned from horses yeah that's where those fillies come into play again too because they really feed off of that that energy and i think that's one of the reasons especially in my younger years i really got on well with the colts because it was just kind of a we wanted to go out there and fight each other and that's what we both wanted to do but the fillies are just they require so much more intuitive nature when you're riding. So I'm, I'm blessed. And sometimes I feel haunted with my mare that I have now. Where she really makes me focus on my emotions in the saddle. That's a cool thing to bring up about the energy, because you even feel that with different people you're around, you can feel the energy that they're projecting at you, whether it's something positive, or, or negative, or they're disappointed or sad. You, and horses, have, I feel like, an even deeper sense of that and what's coming out of you. And so I can see where, as a rider, it's really, really important to, you know, not stifle that, but just channel it into a more positive thing for them because they can absolutely feel it. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, I think 
uh, a lot of times what we see um, with with new horse handlers and new riders is that you have to develop an appreciation for the horse's personality. And sometimes that can be really challenging because some of your greatest race horses and some of your greatest athletic horses in any discipline, they've got a lot of personality and it can be frightening when you have a 1200 pound animal with all this exuberance for their job that can be dangerous if you don't know how to handle it or you don't know how to work with it. Um, so that's something I see with a lot of riders. And I really encourage our students to think about, we have one school horse that she gets very excited about her work. Um, she's very expressive about the fact that she's excited about her work. And it can be really scary for the students to have to handle her or ride her. And, and I try to tell them, if you can't appreciate her excitement about her work, you can't appreciate what she is as a racehorse. So we have to learn to appreciate that exuberance and, and kind of have a positive kind of funny attitude about it. You know, they, they, they enjoy their work and they're excited and their way of showing it sometimes is bouncing off all four feet when they're going down to the racetrack. So. That was a really a beautiful way of describing that. Cause that gave some great imagery to, uh, you know, painting a picture of what that's like. That's really cool. I think that was a good, that kind of leads into your four points that you shared. You know, I've been trying to ask speakers to share what are some of your greatest takeaways that someone who's watching this, who wants to pursue becoming an exercise rider could write these down and already start thinking about them. So I've kind of created, um, I've abbreviated what you send me. So I'll bring them up on the screen and then I will have you, you know, kind of uh, talk more about them in detail. So athletic, athletic ability. Yeah. So, you know, as a rider, whether it's exercise rider or jockey, um, you have to understand that you are pursuing a career as a professional athlete. So your athletic ability plays a huge factor in your success as an exercise rider, particularly the more horses, the more types of horses that you can get on, the more of an asset you are to your employer. So your ability to get on the tough, strong horses, to get on the young, fractious fillies, um, you know, to get on the young horses that need encouragement and the ability for you to kind of put your legs on and teach them to go forward into the bit. Um, it, it's just so important to treat yourself as a professional athlete. So preparing yourself physically, that you are physically able to do the job and then keeping yourself physically active so that you can um, incur any injuries as best as possible. Because one of the best things a rider can do in order to avoid injury from a fall is be flexible that your flexibility and your ability to take that impact when you come off a horse, that really can help a rider uh, avoid injury a lot of times in these types of scenarios. We already talked a little bit about this, but control emotions and stay calm. Yeah, uh, your emotions are huge. And like I said, this was a huge weakness of mine as a rider, and it's still a weakness of mine as a rider. Um, you know, especially when you get on uh, very sensitive horses, horses that are very in tune to what's going on, they feed off that emotion. And and one thing I see a lot with our riders, our young riders, when mistakes happen, they get run off with, they want to blame the horse. And at the end of the day, as a professional rider, exercise rider or jockey, our job is to control and, and have that horse do what we're asking them to do. So ultimately, it falls on our shoulders for success. Um, so to blame the horse is never the answer. We've got to stay calm. We've got to stay engaged into what's happening. And a sense of humor is huge. You know, you got to have a sense of humor because it never goes to plan with horses. I don't care how much you plan or prepare or, or what you do. It never goes to plan. So kind of an ability to roll with the punches and keep a good sense of humor really helps. For this next one, I, I really abbreviated this, but I thought this was kind of the the general gist of, of the point that you were talking about. I'm going to I'm actually going to read this one as with any other uh, professional sports career. Being an exercise rider might not be a career option. Your body can endure long term. So it's important that you are always learning and exploring the various career opportunities that are part of this industry. So you have options throughout your career. Back to my first point, though, take care of your body to prolong your career. Yeah. So, you know, this really hits back to the first point we talked about that you've got to treat yourself as a professional athlete, your nutrition, your fitness regimen. 
Um, and, and one of the keys to being successful as a rider is that you are never done learning. You're never done improving. So the, the mindset that I'm going to go and get on however many horses I've got for my set list in the morning, and that's the only thing I'm going to do to try to be successful in my career is the wrong mindset. You know, when you get done riding horses in the morning, you should be looking at ways that you can improve your fitness whether it's working out, nutrition, whatever that might be. Um, and I see that a lot with riders. They get stagnant in their careers. They're not able to progress where they can hold the tougher horses. And, and it really takes a lot of self-reflection. What else can you do to improve? Because if you can only get on one or two horses in the stable because you're only strong enough to get on those one or two horses, well, why is that? And how are you going to change that? What are you going to do to improve? And a lot of times it's the things you do outside of the saddle that really help with that. Um, but, you know, another a part of that, that point that I wanted to make is that as a professional athlete, sometimes our careers in that capacity are limited. We may not be able to maintain that career for a long period of time. I know for me physically now to be able to gallop would be a lot more challenging than it was 10 years ago. Um, so, you know, I, I really value the fact that with our program, students have the opportunity to earn up to an associate's degree, that they can use that in other capacities and other career avenues and so somebody that is working as an exercise rider, learn everything that you can outside of the saddle, because if or when the day comes that you need to look at another career pathway, do you know how to put a good bandage on a horse? Do you know what goes into training horses? Do you know how to write a condition book? There's so many jobs in the industry that are so satisfying that, you know, I'm hopeful people will, will learn outside of just the basics of riding, training and owning. Here's all the other things you could do as a career in this industry. Yeah. Absolutely. And this, this is something that you've mentioned a couple times and something that other speakers have brought up is that there are so many endless opportunities for learning in this industry. And a lot of speakers and yourself included are you know, a great example that you don't have to just be one thing. You don't just pick a job and it's your end all be all. It can be kind of a consistent progression or transformation of, you know, you might do one thing, you might have several jobs that you do simultaneously, you know, your body might eventually force you to move on from one job to another job, but it's so good to have a well-rounded perspective on the industry. And I think that kind of ties in well to the last point about having an overall passion for it. Yeah, I mean, if you want to work with horses, I think first and foremost, there has to be a passion for the horse. There has to be a passion for the industry because anyone in this industry that has been successful, uh, they've kind of eat, sleep and breathe horses and, and the industry. Um, it's a 24 seven, 365 day a year type of industry because the horses need care around the clock. And it, it's just, it's a lifestyle. It really isn't a job. It's really a lifestyle. So there has to be a strong rooted passion that you truly love what you do, because especially in racing, you're going to lose more than you win. So you've really got to have a passion for what gets you up every morning and gets you to the track and, and takes you there to the horses. Um, but, you know, another thing kind of going back to our previous point, as far as like career opportunities, one of the things I tell my students is that the best problem in the world is to have too many options. So by setting yourself up that you have more knowledge and you have more abilities uh, in, in the industry to have too many options, that you could do so many things. It's when you run out of options that things start to get stagnant. But first and foremost, you have to have a passion for the horses. Dixie, this has been awesome. Thank you so much. I knew I usually have a panel of speakers on, but having you on, I knew that we were going to have a lot of things to talk about and a lot of different, you know, components to dive into. So thank you so much for sharing your time with, with Amplify tonight and all of our viewers out there and uh, best of luck with your students. And I'm sure that I'll see you again soon. Well, thank you. I appreciate it, Denise. Thanks. Have a great night. You too. Bye everybody. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for joining us for another episode of the Amplify Horse Racing Hangouts. That was Dixie Kendall. If any of you have questions for her that you weren't able to get answered in this hour, you are more than welcome to reach out. Contact me at info at amplifyhorseracing.org and I will make sure that you get connected with Dixie and you're able to learn more about whatever you're, you know, whatever info you are seeking. 
And, you know, this was totally unplanned, but I want to throw it out there. I co-host another show uh, for America's Best Racing called La Trifecta. It's a, a horse racing show in Spanish, three friends talking about horse racing. And actually our episode that's going to be this coming Thursday, we're going to have several of the exercise riders on of the um, this year's derby, well, potential derby contenders. So that could be really, really exciting. And that's going to be streamed live on America's Best Racing's channels. And we will try to make it bilingual if you don't speak Spanish and you have a question, you are more than welcome to ask in English and we'll translate that and make sure that you get your question answered because that could be a really cool way of getting in touch with some riders who are getting on some pretty amazingly talented horses every day. So with that, I hope to see you all on the next episode next month. Uh, we might have to change the date, so no guarantees that it's going to be on the third Tuesday in May, but we will post that on our social media and keep you posted on when the next one will be. So thank you all again. Have a wonderful evening.